My name is Devin C. Wright. I'm not a scientist. I have no degree. But in observing the universe for the past 30 years, I think it's under a repelling force. I use repelling magnets to support my theory, but I have never said that gravity is magnetism. This is a solid force. This is a solid force. Newton said things pull, I say things push. Einstein said, there's no pull between bodies in space. They merely follow the path and least resistance through hills and valleys of curved space. This here's a valley. These are all magnets with the north poles up and south pole down. This here is a magnet with its north pole up and south pole down. It shows Einstein's theory of going through space. I want to show you Newton. Here's Newton through space. Point shows you, in my opinion, that if uh, things were a pull, they'd all come together. First, you have to have a theory. This is how it works. Then you build a model to prove the theory. I've done that, but I still call it a theory. How many people years ago, people with credentials, degrees, tried to build an airplane? How many of them? Many people. But who built the first airplane? The Wright brothers. Who were they? They didn't have a degree. People, people, that, that's why they weren't accepted. They didn't have any degree. And they made it fly by logic and common sense. And strangely enough, I've been told by my folks that we are related to Orville and Wilbur Wright. Years ago, my little boy was six years old. He told me he didn't believe Newton. And 12 years later, I asked him why he didn't believe him. And he said he didn't think that a pull by the moon upon the Earth could cause a tide in front facing the moon and a tide in back, high tide in back away from the moon. And I listened to him, it made sense, and that's how I got started, which was September the 8th, 1968, which is almost 20, 30 years ago, I started my theory. And I haven't changed my mind since, that it's, gravity could be a push. I'm in about four or five different small magazines. I'm in, uh, you know, different places. I mean, I made some progress that way. Now, in, in the 1992, Oh, Global Sciences Congress, I was invited back again, which is very unusual that, that Dean Stoney ever invited anybody back twice, but he invited me back the second time. On the sixth day, we all went to a big hall, and we all had our exhibits placed around the hall. In come the Denver Post with a, a photographer and a reporter, and I watched them. And they finally came to me about the last one, and I showed them my tide model I'll be showing you after a while. They were about a minute every exhibit, about one minute. They spent more than 15 with me. All kind of questions, all kind of shots, all kind of stuff. And when they left, now most of these people at this, at this six day conference are all PhDs. I'm, I'm, I don't have a degree of any kind. And they all rushed over and said, in the morning, you're gonna have your picture and the model and the front page of the Denver Post. I said, don't you believe it. No editor is gonna say that gravity's a push. There was nothing the next day. Well, the scientific community has been very, very uh, lax in, in checking it out. I, I've invited them to my museum, and uh, they don't seem like they want to see it. And uh, I've had a lot of negative reports about me in the paper. People that never saw me don't know what I said, and that's unfair. Well, for instance, I had a, I had a fellow that was in the local paper, he used to write an article once a week about space. All he was doing was quoting things that, they, that, that Newton wrote, the rest of them wrote. That's all he's doing. And so one day I find in the paper, he got a whole page about me, how screwed up I am. So I wrote to him. And I said, I challenge you to go against me. Bring your models. He said, no, I don't have any models, but I'll take you on verbally. I said, no, you won't take me on verbally. You will take me on with models. Uh, the Department of Energy, J.S. Kane, told Senator Percy, my theory was worthless. I challenged them to go against me. They haven't, they haven't accepted my challenge. 
California Education Department wrote to the news media and said my, my theory was quackery and nonsense. I challenged them. They have never showed up. And so it goes on and on and on. This here was put out by the Vacaville paper, our neighbor town, and they gave me the whole page about my theory on the, on the theory of gravity. And then not one piece in there, in there only about me, nothing. Now, after, after they knew, got the article from the California Education Department that my theory was worthless and quackery, I got a call from a reporter in San Francisco from the Examiner. And she said, I got a report that you're, that they didn't think much of your theory. And I said, well, they got their opinion. They can do what they want to do. And the more she talked, and the less I defended myself, the more curious she got. She said, I'm going to come out and see you. So she came on out to see me. I took her around, and she said, this is fascinating. I'm going to send my photographer out tomorrow. So she sent her photographer out. He took 105 pictures, 35 free roll, 35 pictures to a row. 105 pictures. How many pictures do you suppose made the examiner? Zero. None. None. I got so frustrated, I guess the word is, I wrote 3,000 papers. Every paper was different. And every paper I thought was interesting. Maybe, maybe five, six, seven years ago, my birthday, I took the papers outside in the big barrel. I set them all on fire. I said, this is it. Take an axe to my model, break them up, and forget about this stuff. As I started to burn, I reached down and grabbed the top papers, and I pulled up a thousand and four. There's two thousand papers I wrote. People will never know what I said. I will never tell them what I said. Would you like to tell us? No, nope, nobody. I sent out 200 letters a month for probably eight years. And when you send out 200 letters a month, you're spending more than a hundred bucks a month. I'm out fifty thousand bucks. If you call that money uh, making money, I made money then. But I, but I'm not. I don't regret one thing. Your money used for something, and I used it on this. Well, this is what I think is going to happen. I think they're waiting for me to die, and then some professor is going to say it was his theory because he has a degree. I want to leave something behind to be studied and thought about. If all the writing I've done, you'll never find one sentence where it says I am right. You will find many sentences where I said I have a theory. And I, and I will tell you this, I can tell anybody else. You might even come out here and say you don't believe me. And that's your privilege. But I'll tell you one thing. Before you die, you will tell somebody about it because it's going to bug you. <laughs> My name is Mariana Antilla, and I've been with Unarius 20 years. Unarius is an acronym for Universal Articulate Interdimensional Understanding of Science. Unarius has done so much for me. It's totally metamorphosed my life. From the little ugly caterpillar that I was, that I can envision myself as I was before I came to Unarius. So now, I, the butterfly that's been let out of that cocoon with the brilliant colors, starting to fly with its wings. That's how I feel, and that's what Unarius has done for me. It's freed me. It's freeing me. Extended now from the Unarius is not a religion. Unarius is a science of life that teaches the energy principles that we are spiritual beings. We're not the physical being that we see here 
the flesh and bones, were truly spiritual energy systems. We are held in peril in the landing of a starship on planet Earth in 2001. The new era of the 21st century verifies the closing of a violent chapter in the life of humanity on planet Earth and the beginning of a new global awareness manifesting in all nations worldwide. These changes are indicative of a new breath that is already awakening the spiritual fibers of humankind to the reality of extraterrestrial civilizations. The year 2001, yes, there is a significance. It's the beginning of the new millennium. It's the beginning of, of a, the, this new spiritual age, the age of the new age of renaissance, of, of logic and reason. The initial landing from the planet Maiton will be in the Caribbean, be in preparation for the future landing of starships from these other 32 planets, which will be landing on the land we purchased in Hamul, the 60 acres. That will be the university, the Star Center One, Unaris Academy of Science, where we're gonna have the teaching university there for the whole world to come and learn. And that's where that will be in Hamul. But the initial landing is gonna be in the Caribbean Sea in the year 2001, from the planet Maiton. Definitely we are visited from extraterrestrials all throughout every civilization. I mean, how else could the civilizations be progressive and do positive things and grow to the heights that they have unless we have, have, have not had um, extraterrestrial intelligence, um, the Unarian Brotherhood is what I'm referring to. Um, incarnate at those times and teach us the higher way of life, the higher principles of life in order to live. Within the last century alone, we've had four archangels incarnated on this earth world. Raphael, who is the higher self of Ernest L. Norman, who established the Nereus mission, and um, Uriel, um, who was Ruthie e. Norman, and Nikola Tesla, whose higher self was Mike Yale, and he incarnated in the late 1800s along with Ruth E. Norman's sister, Esther, who was the higher self of Muriel. So we've had four very highly intelligent um, beings who were archangels who have incarnated just within this last uh, 100 or so years because it was needed for the step up of this earth into the next um, age of spiritual renaissance, the new millennium. I had a personal experience with a UFO, of course it really wasn't a UFO, it was an IFO, it was an identified flying object, that's what I like to call it. I was in the high desert of California, up by Apple Valley. We had a cabin up there and we used to go up there on the weekends. One night, as we were sitting outside, laying on the rocks, just looking at the night sky, there appeared behind us the most brilliant, light, lighted starship reds, purples, yellows, greens, magentas, but like fluorescent neon, and they were just oscillating in a circular form, round and round and round. And I couldn't believe my eyes. And it was right there in front of us. It was hovering close to the ground, and it didn't make a sound. It was just there. I knew without a shadow of a doubt, this was from another world. It, it will never leave my imagination, my mind, my consciousness that night when we saw that starship. We will see why we are making this interplanetary voyage and why we have been so selected to take this great step forward. This is a great responsibility for each of us, individually, and as a whole, for the planet my time. There are starships out there. They are out there. There is intelligent life out there. There are people like you and I. They're here, they've been here, and they're gonna come here in the year 2001. And I am so excited about that. Hi, 
I'm Dixie Evans, curator, president of Exotic World, the Burlesque Historical Society and Museum Hall of Fame. This is the home of the movers and the shakers of the world. Now we can really say that because we really were movers and shakers. <laughs> I danced with a pink hula skirt on the captain's table when I was only five years old. When I was about eight or nine, I'd go in the back of the yard, lean against a palm tree, and I'd sing, Blue Moon. At every movie I saw, I would imitate. And my folks said they never had to go to a movie. I'd just come bursting in the house, and I knew every line. My sister didn't even get to get a line in. I could do everyone's part. And then they did this, and oh, I'd get so furious that they wouldn't sit and listen to me. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I had it in me way, way back, yeah. Well, since 1990, Jenny Lee died in uh, 19, March of 90, and I came out here in June shortly thereafter. And um, she died of breast cancer. So I wondered what was going to happen to some of the photographs and some of the pictures and things. And um, I asked her husband, Charlie, what was going to happen. I would give him $5,000 or something to go someplace else. But I stayed on out here. <laughs> so I've been here 10 years about. <laughs> a lot of the things now, um, it was a lot different when I first came here. Because you see, Jenny was getting uh, sick and things were kind of tumbling down. So. Uh, I would say I, I brought a little spirit to the game. <laughs> Burlesque was very, uh, very big uh, in the 30s. The working class had nothing of their own. They had no hope. They had no job. When you're broken, hopeless, and in terrible despair, you don't know when it's going to let up. All of a sudden, something magical is going to happen. No, it wasn't. But you walk into one of those burlesque theaters, and there was magic. There was life. There was uh, laughter. There were uh, dancers, crazy, dumb comics. They could laugh at their misery. So uh, it was a marvelous thing to, for a few minutes for people to escape uh, that horrible depression. Okay, well, of course, burlesque was mimicking the real, exaggerating something. We had the Loretta Young of burlesque. We had the first lady of burlesque. We had the Anita Eckberg of burlesque. This happens to be Blaze Starr, an original. Uh, we had the Sophia Loren of burlesque. We had the Debbie Reynolds of burlesque. And, of course, this little girl was in the R Gang comedy, little Shirley Jean. But when you're nine years old, uh, you know, you uh, have to grow up. Jane Mansfield's ottoman, and that's Jane Mansfield sitting in this very same ottoman. I painted the wall pink in Jane's honor because Jane Mansfield deserved an awfully lot of credit. She wasn't in burlesque or a striptease dancer, but uh, she said in, in one of her um, documentaries I have, well, if I can't make it in uh, the movies, I can always make it in burlesque, and she would have done wonderful. She would have really uh, given burlesque a big shot in the arm. We may have been able to last another 10 years. <laughs> Sort of what I call my little uh, world, my little wall. Uh, I was the Marilyn Monroe of burlesque. I adored Marilyn with all my heart, and uh, I impersonated her. Yes, I did. This is Marilyn, my dress rather, and this is Marilyn's. I first did a little act, what a girl has to go through in order to get a job in the movies, and I would uh, proceed to remove my wardrobe and take a little screen test on the casting couch. That was one of my acts. I did a number about Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> Well, why would you answer my calls? That's very simple, because I've still got you by your New York Yankee base 
but I never said the word. I would pull out two baseballs from my fur pocket and plant a kiss and throw a baseball in the audience, throw a baseball to Joe. So that was one of the numbers I did. I may have impersonated, but there was no one that could ever uh, impersonate in, or, or take the place of Marilyn. Marilyn is uh, just totally, she, there's no word. Uh, I, I love to be around people in the nightclub. I don't care, drinking, smoking, loud band, I don't care. Because I never had a home life much of any kind. And that was my only home. It was my home, it was my life. So um, uh, I, I loved it. I don't think my contribution was so very, very much. Uh, I think uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have a real great figure, a good looking body, and I wasn't the best at anything. Uh, but I do think I had the enthusiasm. Uh, when I'd go into a club, I would always just sit there and dream and think how things could be a little better in the club, and somehow the bosses would listen to me. I don't want burlesque to die. I want it to continue. I want to build a home for, uh, for struggling entertainers, retired uh, musicians. Uh, we're not uh, belong to all the big federations anymore like we had to. So um, now it's payback time. I want them to contribute some money, some donations, and uh, we want to make a retirement center here for entertainers. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental. But diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat or help you at that automat. <coughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Au revoir. Thank you, ever so.